very much to uh, our midweek Bible studies on Thursday night and uh, teaching through the Old Testament, especially uh, here in the book of Ezra. I am really excited about what the Lord has for us tonight in the two chapters that are uh, before us. We're making our way through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and tonight we're going to take two chapters, chapters 7 and 8. We did chapters 5 and 6 last week, and uh, these are two chapters, I think, that kind of need to uh, go together, especially chapter 8. I'm really excited about uh, something that I've actually been wanting to uh, talk about uh, in recent weeks, and so I'm really uh, looking forward to, uh, again, what the Lord has for us. Why don't we pray, and we'll ask God to bless our time together uh, in his word tonight. So if you would join with me. Father in heaven, I I'm so thankful to you for those that are here tonight. I, Lord, thank you for their love for you and for your word. And Lord, that's why we're here tonight. We're here because we want to hear you speak into our lives, in and through your word. Lord, we love your word. We love you. And so, Lord, would you just minister to us tonight and not allow anything to distract us or keep us Lord, we don't want to miss anything uh, that you have uh, in store for us tonight. So, Lord, speak. Your servants are listening, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so there's actually a 58-year gap between chapters 6 and 7. And so it's for that reason I think it would be good if we had a bit of the backstory so we have a better understanding of what is happening here. We're going to be introduced to Ezra tonight. We sort of uh, turn a corner uh, where the first uh, six chapters uh, in the book were about the first wave of Jews that had returned uh, from captivity to Jerusalem with Zerubbabel. I mean, the book could have actually easily been titled the book of Zerubbabel because the first six chapters of the ten chapters in the book were chiefly uh, focused on him and this first wave of Jews that had returned. Now, we turn this corner and learn about this second return, this second wave, if you will, of Jews that are going to now return to Jerusalem, and this time the focus will be on Ezra. Now, um, if you're anything like me, uh, you're going to really love Ezra. This is an amazing guy. Um, We're going to see the focus be specifically uh, for the purpose of teaching God's people both the Word of God and not only the word of God, but also the worship of God. And he's going to do this vis-a-vis the newly rebuilt temple that has now been completed uh, with Zerubbabel. Uh, And it's been, again, about 58, 60 years. Uh, There's actually been about 70 years from uh, front to finish. There was, remember, a 15-year gap of time where unnecessarily... They had ceased the work because of the opposition. And then through the prophet Haggai, uh, there was a prophecy against them that uh, they had built their nice houses while the temple of the Lord, the house of God, lay in ruin. And so they heeded that to their credit and they began rebuilding uh, the temple. And so now, again, about 60 years has gone by and now Ezra is on the scene. Zerubbabel is off the scene. Presumably uh, at this point it is very possible, some believe, that uh, he has died. So now we have Ezra and he's going to now teach God's people God's word, but he's going to do so in an entirely new context. And by context, I mean now the Jews that have returned and uh, are now there in Jerusalem with the newly rebuilt temple 
are no longer under the rule of Israel's kings as they had been in the past and even the prior generations. This new context, this new dynamic, if you prefer, is now instead of them being under the rule of Israel's kings, they're under the rule of Persia's kings. And so now Ezra is going to, because of his love for God's word and God's people, he is going, and that's his motivation, that's what motivated Ezra was his love for God's word and his love for God's people that so much so that he wanted them to know God's word and not only know God's word but to apply God's word while under the rule of a Persian king. Now, please bear with me here because this is something that we've been talking about as of late. Uh, this was uh, what we had actually talked about in our uh, study through Galatians just this last Sunday. And it's that of having the personal experience of seeing God by way of the personal and practical application of his word move in your life very specifically, simply by applying the word of God. And what we're about to see is Ezra doing exactly that. He's not just teaching them God's word. He's teaching them to apply God's word very personally, very applicably, very practically, and even very specifically. And we're actually going to see a case of that, which is very powerful when we get to uh, chapter 8, which again is one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, uh, really get to the, the teaching. I don't know if you've heard this uh, said this way, but for me it was it, kind of a game changer. Uh, the saying goes like this. Knowledge is information, but wisdom is the application of that information. Now, let me kind of uh, explain uh, that a little bit. Uh, you can have a knowledge of God's word, that's just information. You can know a lot about God's word, but the wisdom comes in the applying of that information. That's the application. And that's the difference. Um, you know, in the, the gifts of the Spirit, you have these companion gifts, the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. And they go together, and here's how that works. You can have a word of knowledge, and the word of knowledge is a very specific word, a word specifically and fitly spoken, prophetically spoken. Now, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to leave it there? Right now, it's just a word of knowledge. Are you going to now apply it and use that gift of the word of wisdom? Okay, this is the word of knowledge. Now, this is the wisdom the word of wisdom, this is what you do about it. This is what you do about that word of knowledge. That's the word of wisdom. Knowledge is just information, but wisdom is the application of that information. And this is what we're going to see Ezra very practically and specifically do in the applying of God's word because of his love for God's people. Now, think about this, and it's, uh, we're going to see this as we uh, jump in, and we will here in just a moment. Just one more thing. Ezra is going to embark on a treacherous four-month-long journey for about 900 miles. You have to understand, traveling that day was treacherous. It was dangerous. It was perilous. And Ezra is going to leave the comfort of where he's at and step out in faith and venture for four long months, 900 long miles. Why? For the purpose of teaching God's word to God's people because of his love for God's word and his love for God's people. So that's where we pick it up now, verse 1. Now, after these things, after the 
events of chapter 6, some 58 years prior. Now we're told it's in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Ezra, the son of Sedaiah. Now, uh, please know that I'll try not to butcher these names as I try to pronounce them. The son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Meriath, the son of Zehariah, the son of Uzi, the son, <laughs> the son of Buki. <laughs> that name, either way, either it's Buki or Buki. And Buki is cute. I don't know what, I mean, what else to say. It's like Buki, come here, Buki, Buki, Buki. Anyway, Buki. The son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra came up from Babylon and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his request. And I want you to pay particular attention to what it says here in the last part of the verse. According to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. I love that. Don't you like that? Don't you want that? The hand of the Lord your God to be upon you. Uh, by the way, uh, this mention of the hand of the Lord his God being upon Ezra, uh, it's worthy of noting that this phrase will occur a total of six times in the remaining four chapters, from chapter 7 through 10, and for good reason. It seems that Ezra was a man who was recognized as having the hand of God on his life as the reason for the blessing of God in his life. We're going to see actually those dots get connected in a very real way here shortly. I point this out for this reason. This is perhaps one of the most important truths in all of Scripture concerning God's hand of blessing on our lives, the hand of God blessing our lives, the hand of God protecting our lives, the hand of God directing our lives. And certainly this was the case with Ezra. Verse 7, some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, and here it is again, according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra, and I want you again to pay particular attention to verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart, prepared his heart, to seek the law of the Lord and, and by the way, this is a big and, and to do it. And, here's another and, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. Wow. Wow. How's that one? He prepared his heart. He prepared his heart prior Oh, would to God <laughs> that verse 10 would be indelibly etched on every single one of our hearts, especially those who are pastors and teachers. This notion of preparing our heart prior to, in anticipation of, both hearing and perhaps more importantly, doing the Word of God. You know what I mean by doing, don't you? Applying. Not just hearing the Word of God. Not just teaching the Word of God. But doing the Word of God. Whether we're teaching it or taught it, 
We want to be doers, not just hearers. In one ear, out the other. Have you ever noticed, I know this is kind of silly, but uh, think about this. Have you ever noticed that we have eyelids, right? We don't have ear lids. I think about the seven letters to the churches in Revelation. By the way, all seven churches are very different. You can't take the letter to the church in, in Laodicea or of the Laodiceans, Laodiceans, better said, and apply it to the church of Philadelphia or the church of Smyrna. Uh, that message was just for that church. In other words, God has a different message for every different church. You can't have this cookie-cutter approach, but there's one uniformity and similarity with all seven letters they all end with this, let him who hath an ear, that's rhetorical, you don't only have an ear, you have two, let him who hath, hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know what's interesting in the Old Testament, replete throughout the Old Testament, you'll, you'll read this, hear, hear, O Israel. It comes in, through the ear gate, you hear the word of the Lord. That's where it starts, but that's not where it stops. That's where it starts, and that's just the beginning. But you are a hearer of the word, and then you need to be a doer of God's word. And again, uh, please keep in mind, this is what Ezra wanted more than anything for God's people. And this is the, the heart of a true leader, a, a true teacher. They want so much for God's people to taste of the Lord and to see that he is good. They want God's people to experience firsthand what it's like to have something very specific from God's word applied to their lives and see the mighty hand of God move in their lives in such a powerful way that they're never the same again. It changes them. Like on Sunday we were talking about, it ruins them. You're ruined. You're, you're spoiled. When you've tasted that, it, you know what it's like? It's like you, you taste lobster or a, a juicy steak. I know this is going to make some people drool <laughs> and hungry, but you, you taste something so good. You're, you're just ruined. I mean, you can't eat anything else because you've tasted the real thing. You've tasted of the Lord and you've seen that he is good. You've seen him do things that only he can do. And he did it exactly as he said he would do it in his word. And it came by way of being a doer of his word. Very practical, very specific. You know, James, and I know you're familiar with this passage in chapter 1, Verses 22 through 25, James draws upon a very interesting analogy in describing uh, the difference between being merely a hearer uh, and not a doer of God's word. He says this, verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. <laughs> what? You know what that means, right? If you're only a hearer and not a doer of God's word, you're deceived. You're self-deceived into thinking that you only need to hear God's word. That's deception. And that means that you and I have this propensity to believe our own deception, to believe our own lies, the lie that all I need to do is just read God's word, hear God's word. No, you're, you're deceived if you think that you are only need to hear God's word. You're deceived if you're not a doer of God's word. And then he says this, verse 23, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, this is what he's like. Listen to this. He's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer 
of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Did you see that connection? Okay, watch this. So now I've applied God's word, and because I've applied God's word as a doer of God's word, then I'll have the blessing, the hand of God's blessing upon my life like it was on Ezra. That's the why behind the what. Now check this out with the mirror. This is perfect. This is brilliant. This is by the Holy Spirit, right? The law of God, the word of God, is likened unto a mirror. And here's how that works. So you look into the mirror of God's word and what do you see? <laughs> you see yourself as God sees you, as you really are. This is where that deception comes in, right? So uh, you, you, you can look into the mirror and you, you always shed yourself in a favorable light. But when you look in the perfect law of, of God's word, you can't get away with that because it shows you you in the mirror of God's word. And oh, by the way, spoiler alert, <laughs> I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. I need a savior, I need a savior, I need a savior. I'm a dirty, rotten, stinking sinner. I just, that's, you know, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. Oh, uh, commandment number one. Okay, I broke that one. Commandment number two, I really broke that one. Uh, commandment number three, commandment number four. I, there's even commandments that aren't in there that I've broken. <laughs> I've broken every single one of them. And that's the point. The law was not given for us to keep it. The law was to given for us to see that we're lawbreakers and that we need the Savior. The, the, the law, the perfect law of God, takes us by the hand as a, 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 a schoolmaster. Takes us by the hand. Now that we've seen our true condition, as we really are, it, it shows us us in our true condition. And now we're, we're ready we're ready, we want for the schoolmaster to take us by the hand to the Savior because now we realize I'm a sinner. Okay, here, here's another, uh, just real quick. I look at myself in the mirror and I see, okay, I got to do something about this. <laughs> First thing in the morning, okay, there's hair where there shouldn't be. There's hair where, there's no hair where there used to be. Can't do anything about that. I need to brush this, shave that, comb this, what's left of that anyway. In other words, I see myself in the mirror and I do something about what I see. And that's what James is saying. You see yourself in the mirror, now you need to do something about it. That's the applying, the application of the information that you have just now seen. I've got some information now. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> we got a problem. I need to do something about that which I'm seeing here. And that's when you become a doer of God's word. And when you're a doer of God's word, you are blessed in all that you do because of it. Verse 11. This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave Ezra the priest, the scribe, notice, expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. He was very skilled. We're going to see this again. Artaxerxes, verse 12, king of kings, not capitalized, don't worry. To Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and so forth. I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go up with you. And whereas you are being sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God, it's not, not the Persian God, your God, which is in your hand, and whereas, verse 15, you are to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, and whereas all the silver and gold that you may find in all the province of Babylon, along with the free will offering of the people and the priests, are to be freely offered 
for the house of their God in Jerusalem. How interesting is that? <laughs> now, therefore, be careful to buy with this money bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and their drink offerings and offer them on the altar of the house of your God in Jerusalem. And verse 18, whatever seems good to you and your brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold, do it according to the will of your God. <laughs> Also, the articles that are given to you for the service of the house of your God deliver in full before the God of Jerusalem. And it gets better, verse 20. Whatever more may be needed for the house of your God, which you may have occasion to provide, pay for it from the king's treasury. Put it on my tab. Tell me how much it's going to cost. Consider it done. And I, even I, verse 21, Artaxerxes the king, issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the region beyond the river that whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, may require of you, let it be done diligently. Up to 100 talents of silver. That's a lot of silver. Uh, I'm going to have to get with Tom afterwards, but I'm thinking that that's like three tons of silver. Think about that, three tons of silver. 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil and salt without prescribed limit. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should, this is interesting, why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? In other words, I don't want this coming back on me. My hands are clean. I'm, I'm issuing this decree for your God, for your house, the house of the God of heaven in Jerusalem. And verse 24, also we inform you that it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom on any of the priests, Levites, or tax exempt. How cool is that? Singers, gatekeepers, Nethanim, or servants of this house of God. Okay, <laughs> that's uh, quite something, isn't it? Uh, a couple thoughts. Uh, most interesting decree and very generous, right? On the part of this Persian king, King Artaxerxes. Um, but we do have, kind of have a problem here. And the problem is, is that Ezra, and we're going to talk about this uh, in a moment, but he's going to be traveling with an enormous amount of wealth in the form of silver and gold and even money. He's given him money as well. In verse 23, the reason I mentioned that it's kind of interesting is because we get a glimpse into the motive of this Persian king. It seems that he wants to appease this God of Israel, as actually was the custom in the day, but wisely so. He does not want anything to come upon him because he readily admits and acknowledges that this is the God of heaven, which is remarkable in and of itself. Uh, the second thought, and this is what I want to uh, actually kind of draw your attention to as we bring chapter 7 to a close. It has to do with the peril that Ezra and all of those who are returning with him to Jerusalem face. They are, think about this, they are prime targets for the many thieves, and there are many thieves along the way in this treacherous 900 mile journey. Now I'm gonna pose a question and we're gonna get this question answered for us in a very profound way in chapter eight. But here's the question. How did they safely complete this journey without being robbed? Nothing was taken. We're gonna see that at the end of chapter eight. They had an accounting of everything. Oh, by the way, uh, these are not just the men that are traveling, which we're going to see in chapter 8 as well, the numbers of those men, who they were. 
uh, but their wives and their children with them as well. Now think about that. You're, you're taking this journey as perilous and dangerous as it is, and you've got that much wealth with you, and these bandits are waiting, just waiting for someone like this to make a journey like this. Well, hang on to that, and we'll come back to that. Verse 25, And you, Ezra, according to your God, given wisdom, set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people who are in the region beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God, and teach those who do not know them. you got a Persian king telling Ezra, you need to teach them the word of God. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> teach those who do not know them. Whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, <laughs> let judgment be executed speedily on him, whether it be death or banishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. Okay, where I come from, they call that a, a deterrent. <laughs> a deterrent. Verse 27 Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem and has extended mercy to me, speaking of Ezra, before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. So I, Ezra speaking, was encouraged. And here it is again. As the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. This is amazing. You know what Ezra does here? He acknowledges and is thankful and grateful for the grace and the mercy of the king and how King Artaxerxes had issued this decree. But it doesn't come at the expense of giving God the glory. He's not in any way glorifying this king. He's, he's acknowledging the king's generosity, the king's grace, the king's mercy, but all the glory goes to the Lord, as it should be. The glory belongs only to the Lord. No flesh shall glory in his presence. Also, Notice in verse 28, where we're told that Ezra was encouraged. Why was he encouraged? He was encouraged because God was blessing him. The hand of God's blessing was upon his life. Now, why again, I'm asking, why again was this man so blessed? Because he was a doer of God's word. The blessing of God in his life, the hand of God upon his life was because of the love for and the application of the word of God in his life. Is that too simple? Sometimes, and I speak of myself, it seems like it's so simple that it's too simple. Think about this. God wants to bless us. I imagine God looking for ways, waiting on standby, as it were, for opportunities, just anything, at any time, he wants to bless his people. It's not that he, he won't, it's that sometimes he can't. He can't bless us. Oh, he, he wants to bless us even, I believe, sometimes more than we ourselves want to be blessed. But he can't. He's looking for ways to bless us. And if we would but obey him, please him, be a doer of God's word, then God's blessing will come. That's just how it works. Now, Ezra, I believe, knew that all the king had done for him, and that's quite a bit, wouldn't you agree? that it came only, which is why he gives all the glory to God, it came only because the hand of the Lord had not only blessed him, 
The hand of God was not only upon him, but the hand of God was also upon the king. The hand of God was directing and turning and moving the king's heart in the direction that God pleased. This is Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart, listen, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Oh, well that explains it. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Boy, is this not apropos for today in the United States of America and the president of the United States of America? President Trump? God's hand directs presidents and kings and rulers. Obama, are you telling me that God's hand directed and turned the heart of an Obama, a Clinton, a Bush? Absolutely. Yeah, but <laughs> why would God do that? Oh, God will turn the hearts of any ruler, any king, any president, because in the end, it serves his purpose. It fulfills and completes his perfect plan. His ways are too high for our understanding. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts, Isaiah says. All right. It's going to get interesting here. Ezra 8, verse 1. If you'll just bear with me on these uh, head counts. <laughs> These are the heads of their father's houses, and this is the genealogy of those who went up with me, from Ezra speaking, from Babylon, in the reign of King Artaxerxes, of the sons of Phinehas, Gershom, of the sons of Ithamar, Daniel, of the sons of David, Hattush, of the sons of Shechaniah, of the sons of Parosh, Zechariah, and registered with him were 150 males. This is going to uh, come into play here in a moment. Of the sons of Pahath Moab, Eliohenai, the son of Zechariah, uh, with him 200 males. And the sons, verse 5, of Shechaniah, Ben Jehaziel, and with him 300 males. Of the sons of Adin, Abed, the son of Jonathan, and with him 50 males. Of the sons, verse 7, of Elam, Jeshiah, of the son, the, the son of Athaliah, and with him 70 males. Of the sons of Shephatiah, Zebediah, the son of Michael, and with him 80 males. Of the sons of Joab, Obadiah, the son of Jehiel, and with him 218 males. This is kind of specific, yeah. Of the sons, verse 10, of Shalamith, ben Josephiah, and with him 160 males. You're thinking to yourself, are you going to keep reading all of these? Yeah, just hang in there. Of the sons of Babai, Zechariah, the son of Babai, and with him 28 males. Of the sons of Azgad, Johanan, the son of Hakatan, and with him 110 males. Of the last sons of Adonikam, whose names are these, Eliphalet, Jael, and Shemaiah, and with them 60 males. Also of the sons of Bigvai, Uthai, and Zabud, and with them 70 males. Now, verse 15. I gathered them by the river that flows to Ahava, and we camped there three days. And I looked among the people and the priests and found none of the sons of Levi there. Wow. Then... I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, El Nathan, Jarib, El Nathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and Meshulam leaders. Also for Jorib and El Nathan, men of understanding. Verse 17. And I gave them a command for Ido, the chief man at the place Kasafia, and I told them what they should say to Ido and his brethren the Nethanim at the place Kasafia, that they should bring us servants for the house of our God. Apparently we have no Levites, so they have to bring some servants, right? Then, and here it is again, by the good hand of our God upon us, I'm starting to really like that, 
They brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Mahli, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, namely Sherebiah, with his sons and brothers, 18 men, and Hashabiah, and with him Jeshaiah, of the sons of Marari. This is the brother of Ferrari, the luxury exotic car manufacturer. You're still with me, right? So I just wanted to make sure. His brothers and their sons, 20 men, also of the Nethanim, whom David and the leaders had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 Nethanim. All of them were designated by name. Wow. Okay. Why in the world do we have and th this detail and need to know <laughs> who came, how many men there were? There's no counting of the women and children. These are the men, the heads. And if my math is right, the total of the men, not again including the women or the children, was about 1,500. 1,500? 1,500 men returned with Ezra to Jerusalem, which is less than the numbers of those who returned to Jerusalem in the first wave under Zerubbabel. In fact, it's considerably less. Uh, in fact, there was about 50, five zero, not 15, five zero thousand, 50,000 men, not just women and children, men that returned from captivity under Zerubbabel in the first wave of Jews returning to Jerusalem. And now there's only 1,500? What's up with that? Well, you see it on the screen. Here, here's the thought. All the Jews that remained there, that didn't accept the invitation to take this step of faith, and it was a step of faith. I'll give them that. Um, they were too comfortable where they were at. You, you go. I'm going to stay. You know, my... <laughs> My roots are kind of, I'm kind of established here. I'm not going to go. And only 1,500 men said, I'll go. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Oh, by the way, I wonder in the end who regretted their decision. Do you think that those who returned to Jerusalem regretted? No. Do you think that those who didn't regretted? You better believe they did. Who were the ones that were blessed? The ones who returned. Isn't it true that, as the writer of Hebrews says, that it's without faith it's impossible to please God? You know, I think about when we took the step of faith to come here, start all over, and start this, this church. It was scary. And I've shared, you know, very candidly about how, I, you know, the first two years I thought, oh my goodness, Lord, what have I done? I thought I had made the worst decision of my life. And now 13 years later, I can't even imagine not having taken that step of faith and being here and seeing the hand of God's blessing on this ministry because I was willing to leave and come and start all over, take that step of faith. I really believe that if without faith it's impossible to please God, that with faith we are very pleasing to God. He is so pleased when we step out in faith, it's almost like he, he can't resist blessing us. He is so pleased that he blesses those, and such is the case here. Uh, what's up with the Levites, though? We're told that the Levites, when, when Ezra, it's, it's kind of detailed, the, the, the narrative is detailed. We're, we're told that he's looking around, he's got the, there's 1,500 men. Okay, they're doing the count. Okay, there's 180 from this man. There's 
150 here, 200 and some here. He's counting and he's going, wait a minute. Where's the, <laughs> these, are the <laughs> these are the priests, man. These are the pastors. These are the servants. What, where are they? They're nowhere to be found. Why? Well, they too, it seems, had become too comfortable and their roots had been dug down too deep in the soil of Babylon. That's the only explanation that I can come up with. I mean, that's what you kind of can surmise from their conspicuous absence. You know, the reason I point this out is because this is one of the biggest problems that leaders face in the church today. There is so much work to do. There's so much of God's work in furthering God's kingdom and there's no man. There's no man who are willing to do it. On Sunday, we uh, talked about this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 35. We're told that Jesus, as he was going about all the cities and villages, and he was teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But, like Ezra, when he saw the multitudes, like Ezra saw the men, 1,500 men, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Why? Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Now picture the scene. He turns to his disciples and listen to what he tells them. He said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful. But here's the problem. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This um, analogy, example, comparison of the harvest would have meant a lot to them in that day, in that culture. I grew up in a small farm town, and at the time of the harvest, the wheat harvest, it was so urgent, and they would hire us kids out of school and in order to get the crops in so they wouldn't lose the crops they would delay starting school that's how serious it was because if you didn't get that harvest in you lose the crops you see the connection it's so urgent the day in which we live we're going to lose people pray the lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest while there's still time before it's too late. The wheat, when it was ready, it was golden. You would look out over those wheat fields and the waves of the wheat fields as they would move back and forth with the wind. That's the grain. That's the bread. That's the livelihood. And you could lose it all. You could lose it all if you don't have laborers to bring in the harvest. It's ready, it's ready, it's ready. We need laborers. Well, verse 21, and here's what I've really been looking forward to. Appreciate your patience. Ezra speaking, and this is what he says. Then, I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might, and I want you to pay particular attention to what he says here, because it's going to uh, be germane to our understanding of this. He says that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions, the little children. For I was ashamed, verse 22, to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road because we had spoken to the king saying, the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. In other words, I already told the king, God's got this. God's hand is on us. So, verse 23 we fasted 
and entreated our God for this. And these five words, I love these five words, I love these five words, I love these five words. And he answered our prayer. Okay. This is the answer. Remember the question that was on the table that heretofore has remained unanswered? The aforementioned question of how did they safely travel and make that 900 mile long treacherous journey without being robbed? How did they do that? Oh, answer, they humbled themselves in prayer and fasting, prayer and fasting, Ezra declared a public fast for God to grant them safe passage instead of trusting in the king to provide an escort. Now stay with me. Nehemiah, when we get to Nehemiah, he had a military escort from the king, no problem. Nothing wrong with that. But Ezra had already told the king that God's hand was upon him. Now, I want to recommend an outstanding book on the subject of prayer and fasting. It's by Derek Prince, who's now home with the Lord, went home to be with the Lord in 2003. The title of it, it's, it's not going to be, you know, uh, <laughs> the title is uncomfortable. Because any time you talk about prayer and fasting, I mean, I'd rather, uh, you know, let's be honest, and you're a lot like me, I'm going to venture to say, wouldn't you much rather get a book and buy a book that's titled Seven Keys to a Happy Life? <laughs> Can we talk? No, this, you know what this book is titled? Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting. I think I've shared this, and, I, and I'm, maybe tonight's not the time, but maybe a topic for another time. I've shared how that God is bringing me to that place in my walk with him where I'm learning anew the power of prayer and fasting. Do you know how powerful prayer and fasting is? I cannot even begin to tell you. And you know, um, one of the things that, and I've heard men of God, in fact, Derek Prince, uh, there's a YouTube video of uh, teaching of his that is just, I mean, wow, just wow. That's the only word I can come up with. And here's a guy that would fast one day a week. This isn't legalism. Please don't, don't, don't do that, okay? He would fast one day a week. And he said there was a season in his life where he got so busy and he couldn't fast. And he said it was disastrous. <laughs> and he never stopped fasting again. And that's just what God had called him to do. But because of what he was doing in the ministry that God had called him to, he fasted and prayed. One, and by the way, there's different kinds of fasts. And don't, uh, you have to be careful with this because medically... Um, you, can, you can actually, um, you know, it can be dangerous. You know, there are fasts where you just, you know, liquids only. Uh, you fast from certain types of foods. You, fa you, you abstain from, deny yourself of those, you know, foods that you really love. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Sometimes it's just, you know, a vegetable fast, no meat. I mean, there's different kinds of fasting. Uh, when I fast, I'll, I'll just do a liquid fast and no food. Oh, it's so hard. But you know, you deny yourself. You deny yourself. And here's what happens when you fast. You humble yourself. And I want to talk about the connection between humility and fasting more in just a moment. But I want to uh, share with you a little bit about what he says. Because in it, he refers to this passage in Ezra that we just read. And listen to what he writes. Ezra did something that you and I sometimes do. 
by testifying to the king, he put himself in a position where he had to live up to his own testimony. You know how, have you ever done that? Where you said, my God will provide. Oh God, you're going to provide, right? That's kind of what happened here. He says to the king, our God will grant us safe passage. Oh God, you're going to provide us safe passage, right? We don't want to get robbed. He writes, by testifying to the king, he put himself in a position where he had to live up to his own testimony. He had told the king, we are the servants of the living God. Our God protects us and supplies our needs. <laughs> they had to make a long journey through a country infested by savage tribes and by bandits. In addition to their wives and children, they had with them the sacred vessels of the temple. What a prey for bandits. The question arose, how were they to be protected on their way from Babylon to Jerusalem? Should Ezra go to the king and ask him for an escort of soldiers and horsemen? No doubt the king would have granted this request, but Ezra felt ashamed to make it because he had already testified to the king that their God, the true and living God, would protect those who served him. At this point, Ezra and the returning exiles made a vital decision. They would not rely on soldiers and horsemen for their protection, but on the supernatural power of God. There would not have been anything morally wrong in accepting an escort from the king, but it would have been depending on carnal means. Instead, by collective prayer and fasting, they committed themselves to seeking their help and protection solely from the spiritual realm of God's power. And God honored it. God honored it. He goes on to write, and this is really interesting. I didn't know about this. The pilgrims used this very passage in Ezra that we just read, where Ezra declared a public fast. The pilgrims, this very passage, used that to declare a public fast prior to their safe passage to America, which in and of itself was a treacherous journey as well. Prince writes this, very interesting, listen. One distinctive practice employed by the pilgrims to achieve their spiritual goals was that of united public prayer and fasting. L let me just say this parenthetically. I, and I speak of myself as a pastor, pastor and church have yet to see the power of God in a public declaration of prayer and fasting. I, I believe that we would just be so changed for life if we were ever to be a part of a public time of prayer and fasting. We could see God do miracles. And oh, by the way, God does miracles. God does miracles. He says of Ezra, being ready to depart, they had, a, of the pilgrims, being ready to depart, they had a day of solemn humiliation. Taking this text from Ezra 8, 21. Uh, Prince notes that the use of the word humiliation indicates that the pilgrims understood the spiritual connection, the scriptural connection, the scriptural connection to what? Fasting and humility. When you fast, you're humbling yourself before God. What does God say about the humble? He gives grace to the humble. He exalts the humble. He humbles the exalted. He exalts the humble. <laughs> Please know that there is this inseparable connection between humbling oneself when one fasts. When you fast, you humble yourself before God. It's self-humbling. This connection between fasting and self-humbling. Uh, interesting to note, 
God doesn't humble you. There's nowhere in the Bible where you're going to say, where you're going to read, God will humble you. No, it it always says, humble yourself. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Now, uh, as one said, that's not to say that God may not deem it necessary to humiliate you when you're proud. But God will not humble you. You have to humble yourself. How do you humble yourself? Fasting. Is not prayer, does not prayer require humility? Oh, oh, uh, effective prayer. (laughs) You know, prayer that doesn't bounce off the ceiling. You know, we can pray with arrogance. God doesn't hear those prayers. He, He resists the proud. He knows the proud from afar off. He, when there's pride, God just says, get away from me. I, I can't, I won't hear that prayer if there's pride. But when we humble ourselves in prayer and fasting, and we humble ourselves, whew, it's like, God, okay, what do you need? Oh, I need safe passage. I got my wife and my children, and we got all of these men and their families. We've got all of this gold and all of this silver and all of this money. And I told the king that you'll protect us. And so, um, will you do that? Yes. And that's what they did. And that's what the pilgrims did. They did it in Holland when they left England before they came to America. Based on Ezra chapter 8. They declared this public fast. The choice of the text from Ezra is singularly appropriate. Both in motivation and in experience, there is a close parallel between the pilgrims embarking on their journey to the new world and Ezra's company of exiles returning from Babylon to Jerusalem to help in the restoration of the temple. One last thing on fasting, and I want to quote uh, G. Camel Morgan and Adam Clark on Ezra. Very good. Fasting does not convince God or talk God into doing what you want him to do. That's not what fasting is. Fasting is saying, okay, Lord, I humble myself before you. And I, I remember when the, the disciples tried to cast a demon out of a boy, and the dad's like, you guys, stop, you're killing me here. So the, the dad takes the boy to Jesus, and the disciples are going, Jesus, we couldn't cast this demon out of this boy. It makes you wonder, what in the world did you do to this kid, right? And Jesus says something very interesting. He says, uh, hey, guys, this only comes out by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. Fasting is a humbling of oneself. There's Actually, I want to talk about that one more time in Psalms. G. Campbell Morgan said this about Ezra. God never fails those who act in full dependence on himself and so in complete independence of all others. And that's what happens when you fast. You're saying to the Lord, Lord, I'm completely relying upon you. I'm denying myself. I'm humbling myself. I'm crying out to you. I'm looking to you. I'm trusting in you. Oh, (laughs) music to the ears of God. That's exactly what he wants to hear. Not because he's God and I want you to come to that place where you have to trust in me. No, I want to bless you. I want to bless you. I want to protect you. You think I want you to get robbed? Are you kidding me? Adam Clark had this to say. Thus we see that this good man, speaking of Ezra, had more anxiety for the glory of God than for his own personal safety. Wow. How's that one? He cared more about God getting all the glory. We're trusting in our God for safe passage, King. He had more concern for the glory of God of God than he did for his own safety. Wow, that's faith. That's faith. Psalm 35, verse 13. You might want to mark this down and then maybe uh, take some time uh, with it later. This is the connection between fasting and humbling oneself. Psalm 35, verse 13. 
Yet when they were ill, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself. How? With fasting. How did you humble yourself? With fasting. That's how you humble yourself? Yeah. With fasting. And listen to this. When my prayers return to me unanswered. What? You mean that the prayers heretofore without fasting weren't answered? Yeah. So when my prayers return to me unanswered, that's when, when I humbled myself with fasting. That means that when he humbled himself with fasting, those prayers no longer returned unanswered. Can I say it this way? When you fast and pray, when you humble yourself before God with fasting, he'll answer that prayer. I, I can testify. I can testify in my own personal life that when I have prayed and fasted, God has answered that prayer because I fasted. I fasted. Prayer and fasting. Well, let's move on. Verse 24, we'll bring it to an end. And I separated 12 of the leaders of the priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, 10 of their brethren with them, and weighed out to them the silver, the gold, the articles, the offering for the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his princes and all Israel who were present had offered. I weighed into their hands 650 talents of silver. That's a lot of talents. <laughs> that might be tons too. Silver articles weighing 100 talents. 100 talents of gold. Wow. 20 gold basins worth a thousand drachmas, two vessels of fine polished bronze, precious as gold. And I said to them, you are holy to the Lord. The articles are holy also. And the silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord God of your fathers. Watch and keep them until you weigh them before the leaders of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel and Jerusalem in the chambers of the house of the Lord. So... Verse 30, the priests and the Levites received the silver and the gold and the articles by weight to bring them to Jerusalem, to the house of our God. Uh, what's, the, what's going on here? What's this about? Well, this is uh, and speaks to an important biblical principle having to do with financial accountability. That's what's going on here. I don't know if it's uh, possible to overstate the importance of this, especially when it comes to the ministry within the local church. Uh, let me say, and I hope you know this, that we as a church have numerous checks and balances to ensure financial integrity here at Calvary Chapel, Kaneohe. No check over $500 can have only one signature on it. it, has to have two signatures. We have two or more people counting the tithes and offerings, and there, there's a signature there. We have all of these checks and balances, and it's for their protection too. And we are very careful when it comes to financial integrity. By the way, I, I think I mentioned this before. I don't know who gives how much. I don't want to know. I don't, I don't want to know that. Because that's, you know, that's between you and the Lord. That's between you and the Lord, right? So we have all of those kinds of uh, checks and balances in place for the purpose of financial accountability. Well, verse 31, that we departed from the river of Ahava on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And here it is again. The hand of our God was upon us and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambush along the road. So we came to Jerusalem and stayed there three days. Now on the fourth day, the silver and the gold and the articles were weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Meramoth, the son of Uriah, the priest, and with him was Eleazar, the son of, <clears throat> pardon me, Phinehas. With them were the Levites, Jezebab, the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, the son of Benui, with the number and weight of everything. All the weight was written down at that time exactly as was uh, need, needing to happen. The children, verse 35, of those who had been carried away captive, who had come from the captivity, offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 
12 bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and 12 male goats as a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord, and they delivered the king's orders to the king's satraps and the governors in the region beyond the river. So they gave support to the people and the house of God. And that's how the chapter ends. It ends with this accounting of all the silver, all the gold, as well as an accounting of all the burnt offerings that were made to God. And lest anyone think that this is just, again, nebulous information, uh, let me hasten to say it's here for a reason, very good reason. And that very good reason is, and, and you'll notice it in when we read free will offering. They gave freely. Can I say this? They gave cheerfully. And God loves a cheerful giver. And to me, that marks a profound change in the hearts of God's people. Those 1,500 men and all their families who arrived safely after praying and fasting and seeing the hand of God protect them supernaturally. I imagine they had the heavenly host encamped around about them. Flaming swords. Nobody dare mess with them. God was protecting them. And they arrived safely. And they knew God got them there safely. Because God answered their prayer and their fasting. And they're praising God for all that he had done. His hand upon them. Their, his blessing upon them. And they wanted to give to God joyfully, cheerfully. Thank you, God. A free will offering. You have been so good to us. Here we are back in Jerusalem. The temple is rebuilt. You have provided so much. And so they give of these offerings. You know, giving changes the heart of the giver. Giving changes the heart of the giver. And this is how we uh, end the Bible study. Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Father in heaven, I... Oh, thank you so much for all that was here in these two chapters. Lord, I am particularly moved by this account of their prayer and fasting. And Lord, I just uh, would ask that as a church, that we would really take this to heart. Just the, the power of praying and fasting even publicly, as a church, praying together and even fasting together to see what you would do as we humble ourselves before you. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.